Hello, uh, my name is Ron Dijon, uh, and thanks for joining us today for another Dine Around Downtown Cooking at Home edition. Uh, this is the third and last episode of our fourth season, but don't worry if you've missed the last two episodes or would like to watch previous episodes from past seasons, you can do so by visiting our website at downtownny.com slash dine around. Okay, so again, my name is Ron Dijon and I am the events manager at the Downtown Alliance. Uh, so we are the Business Improvement District for Lower Manhattan, and uh, what we do is help to make downtown a cleaner, safer, and more vibrant place to work, live, and now visit again. Uh, one of the ways we do that is by providing support to local businesses, and Dine Around Downtown Cooking Home Edition has been part of our continuing efforts to provide such support, in this case, to local restaurants and food security charities that have been impacted by COVID-19 this past year. And with restaurant restrictions being lifted, we hope to see you dining in the neighborhood again soon. Um, today, the Fulton, which is the restaurant we are going to be featuring, has chosen City Harvest. And they are the food security charity chosen by uh, today's featured restaurant. No matter how big or small, every contribution is greatly appreciated. So please check out cityharvest.org and donate what you can. Uh, for your convenience, we just shared that link in the chat box for you. Okay, uh, just a couple of housekeeping items before we officially begin. We want to let everyone know that this cooking demo is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent out via email to everyone who signed up for the program. Uh, during the demo, if you have any questions uh, for our guest chef or for our host, please feel free to submit them using the Q&A feature. And that feature uh, can be located for those using a desktop or a laptop at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you're using a mobile device or a iPad, tablet, or your phone, you can tap your screen once and it should appear on the top right corner if it is not at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the chat box we will reserve to share helpful information with you guys uh, throughout the program if we discuss anything or helpful links, details about uh, the restaurant, um, and also things like our poster plate contest. So if you're cooking along at home, either today or tomorrow, or perhaps over the weekend, you can enter to win a 30 minute private virtual cooking class with tonight's guest chef by simply posting your plate on Instagram using the hashtag dine around at home and tagging at downtown NYC. So check out the link in the chat box and for more information and share those photos uh, and good luck. <laughs> okay, I think that is everything for me as usual. Um, so uh, it is always my pleasure to introduce to you your host for the evening. Uh, please welcome award-winning chef and author and another fellow OG from Queens like myself. Uh, please welcome Rocco Despierto. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate you having me again. And thank you everyone for joining us for the 13th time in what has been a long pandemic. But the good news is we're almost restriction free in New York and you can come visit all the restaurants that we've worked so hard to support during these difficult times. And of course, you're coming to join us for each of these and returning for the next one has been crucial. And uh, your generous donations to the charities the restaurants have selected has been enormously helpful. Thank you, and thank you, and thank you once again for joining us. Uh, today, it's a very exciting day because uh, the restaurant that we're working with is the Fulton. It's the only seafood restaurant, all seafood restaurant ever opened up by Jean-Georges Van uh, a legend, an icon, of course, uh, in New York City and the world. And one of his top uh, executive chefs, Noah Poses, is joining us today. And uh, Noah, I, I think you're there waiting, but I just want to say that he's a native of Philly. He worked with his father, who is also a chef. Uh, and he went to George Washington University, got a degree in international business affairs, and then started cooking. And you'll have to explain that one, chef. How are you today? I'm good, Rocco. How are you doing? Good. It's great to see you. Um, great to see you. Great to be Thanks be on for joining here. us. Uh, Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. Um, yeah, I didn't really, I didn't just start cooking after school. I, uh, you know, my dad put me to work when I was seven year old, grilling lamb chops at somebody's house for a catered event. But uh, he was putting me to work. So that's, that's kind of how I got my chops or lamb chops, if you will. Um, <laughs> now we're, we're going on to cooking. 
Um, so you, were, you, were, you, were, you like me, were a child bride in the, in the restaurant industry. I started at 11, yeah, he, not he, quite as ambitious as you, but. Well, I wasn't really a choice. And then uh, <laughs> and my dad actually kicked me out of cooking and said, you can't do this. That's why I went to business school, but I found my way back in. So here well, I am. It, cert it certainly helps to have uh, a business degree when you go get into the restaurant business. I have one as well, and it's definitely been a game changer for me. Uh, so you get to work with George George Van, Van Richten, JGV, the legend, the man, the myth. What's that like? I've always, uh, you know, ever since my trail at uh, Lafayette in the Swiss Drake Hotel in 1984, I've always wanted to work with him again, never had the chance. Give us a little insight, a little snapshot of what that's like. Um, love JG. We call him JG because I uh, can't always pronounce his name correctly. Very hard. <laughs> um, great, great guy. Very knowledgeable. Um, extremely friendly. Um, super supportive. Knows his stuff. Uh, you know, he's kind of become a brand, a uh, great, great brand ambassador uh, with a, a knowledge of, you know, a dictionary this large of food. And it's, it's been an honor to work with him. And, you know, he's, he's got many restaurants that he's opened. Uh, we opened here at the Fulton. I was the chef for the opening. Um, and I've learned so much from him. And, of course, um, don't become great without a great team. Um, so he's got a great, great team behind him including myself. And now uh, I've got a great team behind me. And that's, you know, that's the only way you can be successful in this business. If your, if your team is just as good and can support you. He's one of the few chefs that I know that have held on to uh, major uh, employers and players in his company for 20, 25 years. So obviously he's doing everything right, not just something right. I know you opened up to rave reviews. And uh, from my visit there the other day, I can see why you have a beautiful setup, an incredible kitchen. Looks, looks like you have a great team. The dining room is absolutely stunning. Million dollar views right on the East River. I don't know that it gets any better. Plus you get to play with what every chef always wants to play with, seafood. Yes. Um, yeah, it's the first seafood restaurant that all seafood that I've worked at, everything else has kind of been broad range of things, but um, definitely something that's been very, very interesting. You get to learn a lot. Um, you get to kind of dive into what's sustainable, what's not, which we're going to touch on in, in a few minutes. And, you know, I know c Spirits is out there um, and we get to learn a lot about what's good, what's not, um, and how to kind of make our, our business and our world uh, more sustainable and, uh, you know, more healthy. I hear you, man. It's obviously a difficult question, a difficult topic, and, and no one really understands what's happening out there in the oceans. And we're already getting questions about sustainability. So we'll get to that in a minute. I understand you're working on, for, for us today, you're going to demonstrate Faroe Island salmon. It's one of the signature dishes on the menu at the Fulton. Tell us a little bit about it. Um, Faroe Island salmon. Um, so the Faroe Islands kind of are off the coast of Denmark. Um, and there's a really, really good stream of water that runs down there, extremely cold waters. Um, we get ours from a farm called Hidden Fjord. Um, it is a sustainably farmed uh, salmon. And really what they do and what they've invested in is, is making the farm, um, a, basically it's a synthetic kind of wild system that they've set up. Um, so the fish feels like they're swimming in the wild. Um, and they are able to keep those waters uh, cleaner than some of the wild waters because they're able to filter some of that stuff out and they monitor what's fed. Um, and similar to how farmers uh, change the land when they harvest crops uh, is the same way that they use their farms. Um, so they will take the salmon from one, one year or one month of harvest and they won't use that water until it's uh, completely kind of regenerated itself. Um, and there's, there's not a lot of waste run off from that. Um, that's, an, that's an incredible uh, approach. Of course, it, it's more expensive. It probably makes it a little bit more expensive on the, on the consumer end, but absolutely from my tasting of it, uh, and your preparation of it seems hundred percent worth it. So if you guys are interested in trying a salmon dish, that's both sustainable and delicious, you might want to run, not walk, or try to make a reservation at the Fulton. How do we start the dish chef? Yes, so uh, we're going to start the dish with the sauce, which is a dashi broth. Um, dashi directly translates in Japanese to 
uh, broth. Um, and it's a base of a lot of soup, um, most notably uh, miso soup. I worked at uh, Morimoto in Philadelphia for basically my first job outside of my dad's company. And uh, they taught me a lot about Japanese cooking and a lot about making miso. Um, and it was the base every day we had to make it. So it was fresh every day. Uh, but, you know, Japanese cooking, it's, it's one of the critical ingredients um, right next to fish. So what we've done is we have kombu. This is the dried, we start with dried kombu. This is seaweed that is very, very large leaf. Um, comes folded up in a pack. So the, the package is not as large as the leaf. Uh, and we soak it in water overnight. And we're just going to pour that into our pot here. Now, Chef, I've seen this in regular everyday grocery stores. Uh, I don't think it's as hard to find as it once was. Uh, but if you can't find kombu, uh, what do you recommend uh, someone does to make dashi at home? Um, a lot of the Japanese specialty stores will have uh, something called, I've used it before, hon dashi, which is basically uh, a dried kombu. Um, so they've, they've made, I'm sorry, a dried uh, dashi. So they've made basically dashi and, and really concentrated it. And you just need to mix it with a little bit of water. Um, you do need to be careful with the ingredients and some of that and the salt contents of that because sometimes it can be very salty um but as long as you're aware of that it's perfectly good good product to use and you don't want to so, make your so own like San sanka for for dashi right a little bit of uh, a yeah, sorry. yes 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 yeah a little bit of you're a probably shortcut. too young to remember sanka so I, i'm dating myself a little bit know, sanka, sanka was the go-to instant coffee when i was a kid I'm only I'm only 18, so you know exactly. I'm just, just um, so we're making dashi so, water kombu. Water kombu, we soak that overnight, um, and then the only other kind of required ingredient in dashi is uh, bonito, which is dried fish flakes. Um, we are going to make it a little bit more uh, aromatic, um, and I'm gonna show you what we're gonna add here. It's just the bay leaves. Time. We have uh, dried shiitake mushrooms, which other mushrooms will work. Fresh mushrooms will work as well. So don't think that you need to find the dried shiitake to make this. Um, if you're adding the a fresh mushroom, you would want to kind of double the weight in the mushroom because uh, it's less potent, has more water content. Uh, we have Thai chili here, which we want to kind of cut up in half just so we can get the seeds exposed to the broth. So you want, in this case, you, you want the seeds, the stems, the pith, you want the spiciness that comes from that all just to remain in the broth. You're not looking to get yeah, rid of so it like most seeds, people do. The seeds are the spiciest part. That's, that's kind of what we want. You know, it's, you know, we have a lot of the broth. Um, we're only adding, you know, one or two peppers, depending on how much we're making. Uh, we really, really need that spice in there. Um, so what I'm going to do with this now that we have everything in there is we're going to put it on the stove. Um, also in the kind of instructions, if you have a pressure cooker, uh, I really do recommend using that less of a mess. Um, and you get a, a kind of a better infusion and you know that the sauce isn't reducing at all um, as you cook it, which will change the flavor. Um, but for for us here right now, I have a pot. That's a great pro tip. Sorry, How but, long would you say, Chef? Uh, we're bringing it up to a simmer. Oh, it's uh, in the pressure cooker. We're going to go put it on the soup setting, and six minutes is good. And then you release the steam, um, and we're good to go. And then we'll steep in our bonito. But that's next step, getting ahead of ourselves here. Um, so I'm going to put us on here. Uh, I'm going to keep it low. Make sure you guys can see me. Put it low so I don't have to pay too much attention to it. Put it on low so I don't have to pay too much attention to it as I'm doing other things. Um, bring it up to a simmer and then let it simmer for about five minutes, 10 minutes. And uh, after that, we're going to steep this in. Uh, the reason we don't put this in as we're cooking it is it, it really clouds the broth and we want a nice clear broth um, for our final product. 
So next we're gonna prepare uh, our turnips. So we have here is baby white turnips. Um, if you can't find baby white turnips, you can use another turnip. You're just gonna cut it down to a bite size is what we're looking for. Um, just have a bowl of water here, just rinse them off a little bit, rinse them under the sink as well. They can be very, very, very dirty, especially if they're coming from a farm and aren't free wash. Um, you don't have to worry too much in this method about getting them very, very clean. We're gonna blanch them and then we're gonna peel them. So as we're, as after they're cooked, um, we have kind of another opportunity to make sure that they're fully cleaned. Um, so our turnips, we're gonna put into a salted water pot and we're gonna cook those until they're nice and tender. So another, another thing is uh, when we're cooking things, doing demos, I always recommend to get everything, everything done, kind of organize yourself before you start cooking your protein, um, especially with fish. It's the fastest thing to usually cook and you really don't want to overcook it. And basically as you're ready to serve, it's the last thing that you have that you need to do. Um, you need to make sure everything's nice, organized and clean up as you're going. Um, makes for less of a mess at the end and you know you want to enjoy your meal not worry about the mess that you made um so we have made also a kefir lime powder um and what we do by that i can't really show you the whole thing because uh, the tools in the back but we have uh kefir lime leaves here fresh you can also buy them frozen um i know they're available online and at specialty spice shops um, what we do to it is actually we microwave it until it's super crispy, uh, take all that water content out of it. And then we use a spice grinder just to grind it up. Um, we have our little spice shaker here and it's kind of a fine, fine powder. Um, just be careful that it can be very, very strong. You don't want it getting all over the place or getting in your nose because it can be very unpleasant. Uh, but it and adds, adds a little nice aromatic component to the dish. Um, um, so just going to go over all the ingredients as well as we have our sesame oil here. Um, we have our turnip tops. This is our yuzu koshu, which we are going to season the, the dashi with at the end. Um, this is at a Japanese, I believe the link was sent out, but uh, Japanese specialty stores will have this. Comes in a bottle. Can't read what that says, but if you know Japanese, you can translate for me. Um, so it's basically, it's preserved yuzu, which is a Japanese citrus and chili. Um, now we have lime and we're going to suprem the lime. Um, supreming the lime, Kind of take the top and bottom off. And you're going to go around the outside. Take all the skin and the pith off. Pith is very, very bitter. So you don't want any of that on there. And you're just kind of going around. Just slow down a little bit. And you're going to, when you go down, you're curling back under. So you can get all of that. The pith is what we call it. The pith is the white spot part. Okay, and you can always double check and come back, make sure we have it all cleaned off. Um, and now what I like to do, I'll well, just hold it in the palm of my hand, and we're going to use the lines in between to know where we're going to cut. We're going to come down and you want to go right against the line so you can get the maximum amount of yields. And you're going to cut right into the middle. The you know, uh, line is sitting on my knife. And then you're going to come back over and cut on the other line. All right, so we come out and what you should get is that. 
So I'm a little OCD. Gotta make sure everything's clean. So is the life of a chef. Except I can't seem to get all my laundry folded ever. <laughs> That's the one thing I struggle at. The one place where OCD is helpful in the kitchen, right, chef? Yes, Keeping it exactly. clean, organized, definitely a good quality for a chef. Be careful, though, because other people who are working with in the kitchen, especially at home, they might not take too fondly to the OCD. You got to leave it at the kitchen door. You can't bring it out to the rest of the house. I'll take it from you. You know, you <laughs> definitely know better than me, I'm sure. So once we have all our lime uh, cleaned and supremed, uh, you can save this. It will have a little bit of juice left in it if you want for something else. Uh, we're not going to use it today. Uh, we're just going to dice these in half. It depends on the size of the lime. Um, you know, if it's a very small lime, you can leave the Supremes whole. Um, they're going in the dish and they're going to kind of provide that acid first um, in the dish. So, you know, it's, it should be basically the size of your thumbnail, unless you have very large or small hands. Uh, but, you know, about that size. So it sounds like you've got lots of layers of flavor in this dish you, that I see that you're building. Uh, looks like, you know, 10 or 12 ingredients are going to make this very comp a complicated flavor, a nice round flavor with lots of highs and lows, heat, acidity. Definitely. I mean, you touched on it. Highs and lows, I think, is like the most important part, right? You want to, when we make a dish here, um, you we want to have it the different every bite so it's exciting um and as you eat it, it kind of develops and you get you know more more flavors that you taste you know heat in the beginning and then it mellows out and becomes sweet and then the next bite is is you know acidic um rather than having it be kind of the same bite over and over again um it makes you know that first bite if it's all the same is maybe good but by the end you're kind of bored of what you're eating uh, so we're kind of try to drive in those uh, complex flavors. And, but we're not using anything crazy, crazy fancy. Um, you know, and you can do it at home with other things. You can change the ingredients in it. Um, I'm coming back over here. I see where we're steaming here. I'm gonna turn this down a little bit. Keep the lid on. Go check on my turnips while I'm here. Um, this is a, a tool I use uh, very frequently. Make sure it's clean because you stick it into food. Uh, it's called Cake Tester. I think you can get it for a couple dollars at any, any kitchen store, Williams Sonoma, et cetera. Um, it kind of tests how done things are. Um, it's called a cake tester, but it doesn't need to be used for cake. Um, so when we're testing, let's see. Let's see, I'll show you guys best here. So you're testing a turnip, um, you know, when it's tender, it goes right through. For example, definitely they're not done yet. So we're gonna let the, uh, the dashi simmer for about five more minutes. Um, and then we're gonna take it off and we let it be uh, bonito steep in. Um, Right now we're kind of at a, a holding or talking place. If we want to go over any questions. That's great, Chef. We have lots, lots of questions. A couple of them are going to probably take uh, more than a minute to answer. Let me get right to the most, uh, most complicated one. Lisa A wants to know, Lisa A is a return visitor. Thank you for coming back, Lisa. Can you, can you address or can you prepare seafood sustainably? Uh, I think there's you know as many opinions on this as there are people on the globe, but we'd love to know what you think, Chef. Um, it's a very complicated issue. You know, anything that I say or, you know, my opinion, um, I might not be totally correct of what's going on right there. You know, the oceans are very large. 
There's a lot that goes on. Um, you know, you, you want to work with good companies, companies that, you know, people personally, at least we do at the restaurant. Um, and you have to trust those people that they're giving you the right information and if they have the right information. Uh, but it's definitely, it's a tough time. I'm, you know, I'm concerned myself, um, you know, raising, raising awareness, um, asking the question, I think all are important. Um, but if I had, I, I would be, I would be lying if I had, you know, the answer of, is everything sustainably, um, you know, harvested that we have. I, I don't, I don't know everything. Um, but it's definitely scary. You know, I watch the conspiracy and there's a lot of questions that I raise uh, directly to uh, my fishermen and my fish purveyors um, as, basically as soon as I watch that and even before. Um, but it, it's definitely, it's an issue. Um, and it's something that we, I think, need to look at and be concerned with for sure. Um, but asking the question, I think, is the, is the first step. For sure. I, I think there are a number of things we can do. Uh, in our own homes, in our own towns, in our own environments. I can tell you from personal experience, from buying fish for over 25 years, there's definitely a depletion uh, occurring faster than the ocean is able to uh, respond. There, there is much less tuna. There is you know, much less swordfish. There are much less fish that used to be plentiful just 20 years ago. And uh, one clue is if it's very expensive, if you're buying bluefin tuna and it's $25 a pound. The reason it is, is because there's probably not a lot of bluefin tuna out there and you might want to just lay off that fish for a little while. If the demand for high impact species goes down, they won't fish for them. The big commercial fishermen will stop fishing for them if the demand goes down. But if we want to eat you know, bluefin or yellowfin tuna every single day or five times a week or every time we go out to a restaurant, they're going to work hard to find those tuna. And the, you know, the process they go through sometimes is not going to be sustainable, and maybe every time is not going to be sustainable. Seaspiracy is a great new documentary if you want to learn more about uh, what's going on in the oceans. Uh, it, uh, it's not going to be uh, like watching a Disney movie, I can, I can assure you, but it's definitely important information. But chefs uh, like John George and Chef uh, Noah and myself and many, many other chefs are always asking our suppliers, where does it come from? Is it sustainable? What's the population like? Uh, you know, what, what do we have? What do you have that's local? Uh, it, was it bycatch? You know, how do they fish for it? Do they use trawlers, long lines? That, those kinds of conversations are conversations that we have every single day to try to be as responsible as possible. Ultimately, nobody knows what's going on in the middle of the ocean in the deepest part of the seas, which is essentially a big part of the problem and what Seaspiracy uh, spends a lot of time focusing on. Let's say you should. Definitely. Well said. Well said. I you know, completely agree. And yeah, we <laughs> spend a lot of work and hard hours trying to figure out what's what works best. Um, you know, we try to get mostly local stuff um, at the Bolton one because, yes, it's cheaper. Um, and two, we know a little bit more about it. Uh, you know, this the salmon is, a, is one of the kind of exceptions is because we we know the farm and we trust the farm. Um, so we want to support that. And, you know, the wild thing also is I think I added in is the wild catching wild versus the, you know, a farmed uh, product. Um, you know, you can, you can find out a lot more usually about the farm products, good or bad, um, where it's wild. You really don't know where and how and who, um, you know, and, and how the ocean was treated um, while they fished. You know, it's, it, there's, they're out there, as you said, in the middle of the ocean. Um, you know, how are they doing it? It's, it's harder to track. Um, not that it can't be good. It can definitely be good. Um, but I think I feel a little more comfortable with knowing more of the information. Um, and as with any difficult um, topic, the more you ask, the more you know, the more informed you are, the, the better your decision will be. Luckily in New York City, we have farmer's markets and we have local fishermen that we call them baymen because they're generally going out to, you know, a shallow bay, throwing out a net pulling in fish and selling it the next day at the farmer's market, they're not gonna have a major impact on the species. They're not gonna cause declining numbers. They're gonna essentially be what we would call sustainable. And they may not have fish that you're familiar with, but if you want, if you're really concerned about sustainability, those are the fish you should be eating. You know, if it's the dollar a pound butter fish today, there's nothing wrong with that. Or if it's local blue fish, or, you know, if you're eating oysters, try to make, you know, buy oysters that are, harvested off Long Island in the in the colder months 
uh, if they're coming from Canada and Japan, the, generally the more fish travels, the less sustainable it becomes. But this is a big topic. We could spend the whole day talking about know, it. Right? And no one really knows, that, no one really has the right answer. But uh, Lisa A, thank you so much for bringing it up. Very important topic and something we should all be uh, aware of, of course. Uh, Peter Schlosser, thank you. Thank you for coming back. He says hello and thanks. Chef Lois Burke says she has at least five different cooking oils in her kitchen, but no grapeseed oil. What's a reasonable substitute? Uh, canola, anything high smoke point. Canola, uh, safflower, uh, even peanut, you can use vegetable oil, um, anything that we're going to go 400 degree or above smoke point. Don't use, uh, not using really olive oil to sear, um, can burn very, very easily. It's a low smoke point oil. Um, so I hope that maybe one of those can work. That doesn't need to be great. Thank you, Chef. Uh, anonymous attendee asks, is there a list of past winners from Poster Plate? And there isn't a list per se, although I'm sure Ron, Shelley, or Craig are working on it as we speak, but you can check IG uh, and the hashtag dine around at home for all the postings because they do have to post on IG with the hashtag dine around at home to be considered for the contest. So if you check that hashtag, I'm sure you'll find uh, a few of the past winners. Uh, Peg Taylor wants to know, when do you add the Bonito if you're adding a pressure cooker, chef? So you, you add it at the same time. Um, so we're gonna take, I, I, we're done here. So I'm gonna show you the next step. So good question. Maybe you're part of the script. Um, so we have our dashi here. Um, gonna put it there. So same process as if it's in the pressure cooker. Pressure cooker is off now, release the steam um, and you're gonna take it out and it's just sitting kind of on a tabletop. Um, and we're going to add our bonito in. We're not gonna stir it. We're gonna just let that sit there like that. Um, it'll, it'll hydrate itself, as you can see. And you just leave it there. Um, we're gonna leave it here for 30 minutes. Uh, after 30 minutes, we are gonna strain it out. I do have my finished product um, to show you guys. So just for time constraints, but 30 minutes, strain it out through a, a chinois or anything that you can pass fine mesh strainer. Um, if you want to get really, really uh, nice uh, clear broth, you can put it through a coffee filter, uh, not totally required, or kind of a, a linen, um, if you have a cheap white linen or a, or a synthetic like linen like yeah, so I, I, I couldn't agree more. The old school Mr. Coffee coffee filter is a fantastic way to clarify anything that you're making, whether it's tea, coffee, tomato water, you know, dashi, uh, chicken stock, everything gets caught. They do get clogged quickly, so make sure you have a few extras. And if you can get also, your hands on the uh, commercial size, it's very good. Very, the commercial size can hold a couple of quarts of liquid at any one time. And for some reason, hanging them helps the gravity work, work on it and, and uh, helps the liquid fall through faster. I'm not sure if that's just something I, I believe is true or is true, but I, I think true. it's true. Definitely true. Definitely true. Also, be patient. I also I went at the at the restaurant. We're prepping. We're trying to get ready for dinner. Um, if you go in there and you try to work it too hard, and then the coffee builder breaks, um, it's not Ooh. a good thing. You have to do yeah, it. Yeah, then over you ruin the whole batch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then you have to do it all over again. Yeah, the linen like um, is another good one. Obviously, um, cheesecloth works fairly well too. All right, so Rocco here, we have our uh, turnips. Um, they've been in the salted water. Um, again, I have cake tester here. Um, so basically, I'm gonna stick it in, kind of like a potato almost. Um, and if it kind of just falls right off, it's nice and tender. I can feel that it's cooked. Um, we're gonna take those out of the water. You need to take that out of the water as well. Just let Jeff, them while you're working down. on the turnips, Erin wants to know, uh, she said it's silly she couldn't find turnips even at Whole Foods. Instead, she got a mix of radishes. Will that, will that remotely work? What do you say? Yeah, nothing wrong with the radish. Do it. Um, they're not just, you know, depending on what radish you have, uh, can be very, uh, strong, spicy, or bitter. So it depends on the type of radish you have. You might have to treat it a little bit differently um, and change the seasoning in the water. 
that you cook it in, maybe even add a little bit of sugar. Um, but taste the taste the radish when it's raw, kind of give you an idea of where it is. And then of course you're gonna taste it once it's cooked. Um, so if you have time, you can kind of test around with it. Um, if not, you know, kind of just gotta go for it and see how, how it works. It's how we it's how we make a new dish. Maybe it'll be better. And Chef Jun G wants to know what can you substitute for the kefir lime leaf? Um, so we can just kind of omit it or take it out. Um, a little bit of lemon or lime zest, sorry. Um, using a microplane or a zester at the end is a good substitute. Uh, if you get really fancy and you find fresh yuzu, that's also a great, great substitute. Very expensive, but uh, super special. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's lime powder out there, but that would be another substitution. Um, yeah, if you're, it, it in downtown, very... uh, if you're in downtown, you can go to Sunrise, Mart, or Calustians, and they have a lot yeah. of this stuff. Uh, you can just walk in, and they usually have it in stock on the shelf. Um, and sometimes Sunrise has fresh yuzu, the, the actual citrus itself. So give it a shot. If you're in New York downtown, might as well take a walk. It's a great adventure. So I'm just going to show real quick how we clean the turnips. So the skin, once they're cooked, it comes off very, very easily. Take a little paper towel here and it just rubs, rubs right off. That's so um, cool. And all that dirt. Great tip. Gone. We're going to trim the green off also because it can, unless you really want to get in there, wash it. They're definitely edible. Um, it does trap a lot of the dirt because the turnip kind of grows up through the dirt and traps all of that. Um, so we are going to trim it off. As you can see there, there's a lot of dirt right by the base of the green. So just fill it up. And then again, you know, depending on the size of the turnip, we're just going to kind of cut it into a bite-sized piece. Um, and then we can reserve these. Um, I'm going to start cooking the salmon now. If you're all right with that, Rocco. Yeah, else. yeah, we'd love to see it, Chef. Please go for Great. it. Um, they gave me two pieces here. One cool. One if second. you could just show us the salmon real close yes, uh, for a second, we'd love to see. Stage it up for you here. Okay. What the, ult the ultimate farm salmon looks like. So salmon gets its color from what it eats, right? So orange comes from krill, a lot of it, uh, which is little, little tiny shrimp. Um, there are also like, as we talked about sustainability, uh, there are a lot of feeds that uh, a lot of different salmon gets and, and artificial kind of dye that go in there. Um, you know, something that you can get a very pale colored salmon. It's not necessarily bad. It just depends just what it eat. Um, so it's nice, nice, bright orange. Um, you can see it has two sides. This is the top of the loin. Um, and then this is where the skin was. This is the bloodline, if you will. Uh, we're going to season this. Salt. Pretty generous for salmon uh, with the salt. It's a lot of fat. Salt helps cut through that. Also, it's a little thick, thick piece of salmon. Uh, we're going to do a little pepper. Um, and then we have our seasoning mix, um, which you can kind of sub white and black sesame seeds. This does have white and black sesame seeds in it, uh, along with uh, soy powder, um, a very hard to find pepper. Um, it's called a uh, yagenbori and you can get it right online there at Lab Boutique. I, I never know how to say these ones, but you know how to say it, right, Rocco? I think you said- No, it right I don't, tell day. me, tell me. No, I don't La know how to say Oh, okay. No, no, there it is. La, I, it's, it's French, so. Okay, I can't see it from here. I'll get John we'll, George. We'll figure it out. The, there we go. So, so uh, that's a, uh, what, what kind of pepper is it? Is it long pepper or something like that? No, no, it's a, it's a dried, it's a dried pepper. It's got a, a very long name. I'm, I'm blanking Copy. out okay. right now, but. Got it. No, no worries. I'll get the ingredient list out to everybody. So press it nice and firm. Then we're going to take that back and we're going to go to our pan, heat our pan up. Um, I always recommend that before you turn the pan on the heat, um, you put a little oil in there so you can see how hot it's getting. 
Um, you know, if, it, if it's not doing anything, then you know the oil and the pan aren't very hot. If it starts smoking and burning and catching on fire, it's probably pretty hot. Um, we're just gonna use the pan to sear the skin. I'm sorry, to sear the spice, toast it up a little bit. Um, and then we have a tray here. You can go into another pan or you can use the same pan. You just need to make sure that the pan cools down uh, a little bit before you add, uh, we're gonna add water. So before you add water, you wanna make sure the pan is cool. Just gonna set our tray up, come out. So the water, the reason we use water um, is to help regulate the temperature. So when you have it in the oven, um, it doesn't get too hot uh, and the salmon doesn't sear on the, on the flesh, doesn't dry out. Um, yeah, water only gets to yeah, 212 of boiling. Um, so it, it helps keep that tray a little cooler in the oven. Uh, and the oil we use on the pan is just to help it if we run out of water, um, help it keep it from sticking on the pan. So we do want to make sure our pan is nice and seasoned uh, so it doesn't stick. So you want to get your oil nice and hot. We don't need quite so much oil. I'm just going to pour a little bit out. Okay, so it starts to uh, starts to ripple, right? You can kind of see this, you know, it's getting pretty hot. Um, once it starts to smoke, uh, it's not necessarily a terrible thing, but you do want to lower the heat a little bit. Uh, you don't need new oil unless it's bellowing in smoke. Um, just turn it down a touch. Okay, we're going to put it spice side down over there. So you'd see, would you call it medium to high heat at this point? Uh, I've turned it down to medium. The, you know, this, you turn it down. Just okay. want to be so careful. Was... You know, it won't hurt it if you have it on a lower heat. If you have it on a high heat, um, you can burn the spices, uh, which would be very bitter. You don't want that. So you see, it's really, really quick. We're just toasting the spices and kind of helping them stay onto the flesh. Um, then we're going to flip it over and on, onto our pan here. And this is, this is a pro technique that no one would think about doing at home, but look at the extra step that occurred. He, he toasted the seeds on the fish in a pan and then put it in the oven. If you put it straight yeah, so in the these, oven, you wouldn't get the same result. Right, you wouldn't get those, those aromatics out of the uh, seeds and also it doesn't stick as well. Um, you can see right now, like I can't really even rub them off if I wanted to. Um, going in the oven, 350 degrees. Again, our water there is going to help regulate the temperature of the salmon. Um, as we're cooking the salmon, going to heat up our dashi, which I have strained. And we also have our turnips um, that we're going to heat up in the dashi as well. Again, while you're doing all this stuff, it's very, be very uh, careful not to reduce the dashi drastically change the flavor. Just want to heat it up, get it hot, and then take it off. Um, I'm going to start setting the stage for our plate as the salmon cooks. Um, like to get the plate hot before you put it in. Put, put the dish in, that is, the salmon. Another, another useful pro tip, getting the plate hot. You might think it's, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Meh. Just let's use the, the plates right out of the, the cabinet, but this makes a big difference. This helps you keep your food hot from, you know, stove to table. Yes, and if you know you have to clean down a little bit before you sit down to the table, you have a nice hot plate, helps keep it, keep it hotter for a few more minutes um, as you clean down. But if you don't need to clean, no problem. So the salmon will take um, at 350, about six, 
six minutes, maybe a little bit less uh, for medium rare, which is kind of what I recommend for a good quality salmon. Um, my mom always used to cook me salmon and she's, she was not the best cook. It was always well done. Um, so I actually didn't eat salmon for many years because I thought that's what salmon was. I wouldn't even, my, my dad, who was a chef, as we talked about, yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even let him cook it for me. So as, as the salmon cooks also, you can kind of see it turn opaque on the sides. Uh, this is still raw, but you can see as it's starting to cook, uh, it's going to be more and more opaque. And the doneness of salmon is really your personal preference. I've seen people eat it from, you know, body temperature, basically 100 degrees in the center to, of course, everything like well done, like chef's mom prepared for him. And uh, I, the, the, the usual, the, the rule of thumb with farm salmon is rare to medium rare is going to yield the best result. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself adding fat back, which is why we use mayonnaise in so many dishes in America, because we cook the fat out of the food and then we replenish the, the moisture by using mayonnaise or another fatty sauce. Yeah, it's also, you know, it's a textural thing as well. You know, salmon, cooked salmon versus, you know, raw salmon, um, much different texture. You know, you kind of want the salmon to melt in your mouth, um, not have it to be like pulling at it. Um, but, but also if you undercook salmon, you know, don't be afraid that it's going to hurt you because, you know, you know, sushi, right? So there's nothing wrong with, not going to make you sick um, unless you eat a lot, lot, lot of it, but. So we have our sauce hot here. It's our dashi. Um, we added some more of the spice in there as well um, and salt. What we're going to do now is add a little bit of butter. Butter and dashi is like heaven. I was taught that uh, actually not too long ago by a young gentleman by the name of Greg. Um, and this is where we're going to add our yuzu kosher. See, it's like a chili paste. Very, very potent, very spicy. We're just going to add a little bit in there. Yeah, that stuff will make you pucker. So yes, just a tiny definitely. bit will do it. Yeah, definitely. That, that jar could last a home cook many, many months. Keep it in the fridge once you've opened it. My last years, actually. But it depends how much you use it, you know? Yeah. Just use it on use it on a lot if you get it. It's very good stuff. So I'll tell you, we have about two minutes left on our salmon there. Um, you can start kind of plating everything else. Sure, let's see it. The other thing about overcooking salmon or any fish or meat is you lose a lot of the volume. So if you start off with a six to eight ounce portion of salmon and you overcook it, you're going to end up with six ounces because you've basically expelled moisture and fat from the salmon through the force of radiant heat. And, you know, that's why it always when when you're cooking proteins and they shrink up on you, everyone gets upset. But the reason they shrink up is because they're generally overcooked. So Keep, keep those ounces for yourself. Let's eat those. Let's not throw them away. Yeah, it's definitely something people have mentioned at the restaurant too. You know, you order steak is a good one, but salmon as well. You know, you order a well done steak and it's supposed to be 12 ounces, but it looks like it's eight ounces. You lost, you lost all that stuff when you cooked it so much. All right, so we look at our salmon here. I can still see that it's a little on the rare side. Um, again, I'm going to use a big kind of cake tester here. Um, so you know how the salmon has the natural uh, separations here and if you go through with your cake tester and you don't feel any resistance um it's cooked past rare um again it will continue to carry over and cook a little bit more as it sits um i actually think it's it's good if we let it sit for about a minute or two it'll be a nice medium rare so i'm gonna let that sit out of the oven um and chef if i may we posted a link to a cake tester uh, Atco has uh, stainless steel cake testers, just like the chefs. This is an indispensable tool. Every pro chef uses them to test all kinds of doneness and proteins, vegetables. Every great chef you'll see will have at least one in their jacket or in their side pocket. I have to, uh, yeah. get, get one at home and uh, you'll see it'll improve your cooking by leaps and bounds. 
It's very important information that's very hard to get without a cake tester. Definitely. Brings up a good point also. Get, you know, kind of like while you're cooking, get tasting and, you know, get, get in contact with your food so you know where it is and you know how it changes as you're cooking it. Um, you know, cooking blindly without tasting along the way um, is very, very difficult because um, you don't know what you're going to end up with. If you taste it, you can adjust while you're cooking, you know, so another, another tip there. So we have the warm turnips in the plate. I see you've put yeah. the dashi in a little pitcher on the side. Yeah. We're Looks like put... we're getting ready to close this dish. We are, we are getting there. We're getting there. So we have our salmon here. Um, so How salmon many ounces is that, Chef? Six ounces. Six ounces. That's a nice portion for a restaurant in today's world in New York. Yes, definitely. So as salmon cooks, also, if it's, especially if it's a very high heat, uh, it will release albumin, uh, which is this little white stuff. I don't really like the taste of albumin and texturally it's not the best thing. Um, very kind of like chalky. Uh, what, do you, what do you think it tastes like? It Rock tastes out. like overcooked egg whites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's essentially one. the same kind of protein structure. Um, so salmon is in, and then we have a uh, sesame oil, which is nice, very aromatic and tasty. I love sesame oil. Uh, I use it on a lot of stuff. And we're going to put a pretty generous amount in here, basically coating the bottom of the plate. Um, we have our turnip tops, um, which we saved from the turnips that we're just going to garnish with. Uh, we have our keeper lime powder. Gonna kind of spread about the plate. So I think you just dusted the plate with kefir lime. There's uh, turnip, turnip leaves, and uh, we're probably about to add dashi. Uh, and while we're waiting for the chef to return, let me just answer some questions. Kefir lime powder, Christy, is a good question. Uh, kefir lime powder is very aromatic. It loses its flavor quickly. So if you're making a large quantity of it, uh, freeze what you're not using because it'll stay aromatic in the freezer. But don't keep it for too long. Just make what you need. Uh, Peg, same question. What kind of leaves did he microwave? They're called kefir limes, uh, kefir lime leaf. There is a, a lime tree called the kefir lime in Thailand and uh, the leaves are really aromatic. They're a tiny bit fibrous. So using a spice grinder is a really great way to process them. Uh, Ava said she won the, the Francis Tavern contest and it was the most exciting event to watch Chef cook. He showed me how to make fish and chip and mushy peas. I had the fish and chips there, Ava. They were delicious. The fish and chips, it's the size of a skateboard, by the way. The portions are so huge at Francis Tavern. If you want to go and, and you know, talk about good value dining, it's an incredible environment and the food is top notch, but the, the portions are really generous. So if you want to go in with a family and you're worried about, you know, ordering an entree for a kid who's not going to finish it, that's the kind of place where you can easily share. Uh, M.G. Sommer also asked about the kefir lime leaves. It's spelled K-A-F-F-I-R, not to be confused with kefir, which is a probiotic milk drink that is made by fermenting cow's milk or goat's milk. Kefir and kefir are two different things. Uh, thank you for answering the question for Peg. Uh, the name of the documentary to answer New York Institute of Fine Arts is Seaspiracy. We put a link in the chat. Seaspiracy. It's relatively new. It's on Amazon and Netflix. It's on every uh, streaming uh, service. Radishes lose most of their bite. Cheryl Quinn says, that's true. If you, if you cook them all the way, you can also cook them a little bit less and they'll not lose all their bite. Turnips will lose their bite if you cook them too much as well. Um, I think radishes are a great, great uh, substitution I'm for turnips. I'm back. Are you, Sorry. Are you there, Chef? Great. That's all right. No problem. We're here. My, We're internet, my internet disconnected. The Wi -Fi we understand. We understand. <laughs> Just getting to the question. Someone asked about black lime powder, chef. What do you think about that? Black lime powder. I, I honestly can't say that I've ever had that. There uh, you go, Kat. If you find try it, it, I'll try I'll bring it, it by like and it. I'll taste it. Yeah. That's let me know. Great. That's great. Uh, we just post, there you go. We just posted the link for the Seaspiracy trailer. How does the dish look, Chef? I think it looks good. 
You want to I'm sure it does. Let's see. Tilt it, it down a little bit. Let's see. Yeah. We have a our sauce here. We pour it. We pour this at the table. Um, that's such a that's such an important element uh, of dining that we don't talk about enough. In every JG restaurant, the service is impeccable. That's probably how you present it in the restaurant, right? Yeah, this is it. This is at the restaurant. If you like what you see and you don't want to uh, do it at home, definitely come in. Visit us at the Fulton. Um, you can reserve on resi.com. We're very busy this weekend, so very sorry if you want to come this weekend, but don't have a ton open. But in the future, please um, you can follow on Instagram. We post a lot of stuff when we do new dishes on Instagram, the Fulton NYC. Um, follow me on Instagram, Chef Noah P. Um, what else we have to, we have to talk about? Uh, City Harvest. You guys have it. chosen City, City Harvest. Harvest. As your, yeah, yeah, yeah. So City City Harvest is actually uh, JG has worked with them for a very long time, and he kind of introduced me. But they do great things uh, for food usage in the city, so you don't have to kind of throw those items out. And gets to people who need them that can't really access them. Uh, when we actually had to close down, unfortunately, for the pandemic, we gave all of our food to them. They're a little overloaded because there's a lot of people trying to do that, but we loaded up a big truck, got to City Harvest, and uh, got all of our food out of here as well as we gave it to our employees. But they help us out. Um, really nice to work with, do, do good things for the city. Yeah, for those of you who have been uh, who joining us for the second or third time, you probably noticed we are often donating the proceeds to City Harvest because City Harvest uh, does a tremendous job and uh, many, many chefs in New York City are uh, involved or on the uh, board or the entertainment council. They're the largest privately owned uh, food bank and they, they literally make miracles happen. They can turn a dollar into $8 worth of food and they minister to millions of New Yorkers who are food insecure. So we're very passionate about, uh, all, of, all of us chefs are very passionate about City Harvest. Let's see if we can get to one or two more questions before we go, Chef. Are you gonna take a bite? Let us see what the magic looks like. Let's do it. All right. Wow, GG, I'll thank ask you. me a question while my mouth is full. <laughs> I won't do that to you. Uh, Ava Heinemann says, she went to Sunrise before this and they tell you where everything is, the place is heaven. I used to go to Sunrise just for fun, Ava, just to look around and see what was new there. Uh, the name of the farm to purchase yuzu. Well, yuzu is uh, often not available fresh. We usually get it in juice or preserved form and Sunrise would be a perfect place to get it or Katagiri. Now look at that fish looks incredible. So what I, I'm imagining is you have this buttery melt in your mouth, delicious salmon taste, the bright multi-dimensional broth, and then the stable, the stability that the turnips bring all mixing together in your mouth at once. There's there's some uh, heat coming yeah, from the Thai, nice Thai bird chilies. And, and, and sweetness here, and you got a little chili, and you got the personal limes, as mentioned. I really love the sesame oil in this as well. It's like extra dimension, very, very aromatic. So every time you kind of take a spoon, you get a nice little snack of the sesame oil. I would say it's cooked perfectly. Good job. Yeah, I would say it's cooked perfectly as well. Maybe give us a close-up of, of a bite just so we can see what a perfectly cooked salmon looks like. So it's not quite opaque in the center. It's a little but, jiggly like jello. And then it melts in your mouth, right? It's the important that you don't have to like pull on it with your teeth. It kind of just falls apart. All right, Chef, looks incredible. Thank you so much for demonstrating what, what is probably one of the great salmon dishes of our time. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your busy day too. You guys are getting ready for service. You, the people who are watching may not realize that you've got a whole team of people starting to stare you down who are anxious to get into the kitchen and get ready for service. They probably got 250 people on the book for tonight. So uh, this is definitely it's very, very generous. That's a good guess. Was it close. a good guess? Okay. Very close. Very close. Thank you. Please uh, allow me to thank Chef Noah Poses and of course, Chef JG and everyone behind the scenes at the Fulton for doing the great work that they do. Uh, and don't forget to donate, help support City Harvest Food Security, uh, a food security charity chosen by the Fulton. You can visit them at cityharvest.org to donate to them directly. Uh, and we, we have lots of questions. Uh, we're, we're, of course, as always, going to get to them and we'll send you the answers. What we do is we, we bug the chef for the rest of the day for the answers to the questions, and then they're sent out first thing in the morning uh, be, all because the team behind the scenes is working hard to get you those answers. 
There are quite a few questions left unanswered and we'll, we'll definitely get to you. Please don't worry. Um, we, we do have some more, uh, maybe some more things coming up, uh, but don't before that, don't forget to post your plate. Uh, you, you, you'll win a 30 minute one-on-one -on -one cooking demonstration or cooking class with Chef Noah Posis of the Fulton. Uh, please take your best shot at the featured recipe, the salmon with turnips and dashi and post a picture on Instagram. Remember, tag Dine Around at Home and Downtown NYC and tag me and tag the chef too. We'd like to see, we'd like to keep track and see what's going on. Of course, Chef Noah will be the person who ultimately decides who did the best job. And stay tuned, uh, a special summer episode and more coming soon. This has been a very exciting year. Uh, thanks to the Downtown Alliance, a public-private partnership between the business owners of downtown Manhattan and the city of New York, and all the people who work behind the scenes, Ron, Craig, Shelley, who do a wonderful job of bringing this incredible information to you. It's always fun. I love talking to you guys. I love answering your questions. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Until then, bon appetit. Bye-bye.